The rise of digital ag technologies has created new challenges. No one tool can do everything, and at the same time, these tools are not easy to integrate. There is no one silver bullet. It's really around leveraging, disparaging data sets and information and bringing that together through integrations to help drive further insight around those particular tools. Brendan Bachman and his team at Growmark don't just want tools, they want solutions. So they called Bailey Stockdale and his team at Leaf Agriculture to build infrastructure that makes data usable. When we first met Growmark, they had one problem and it was, we have field boundaries in three different places and we don't know which one to use and we need these to all kind of somehow work together. But we have these underlying API connections that we can bring together, put them into a standard format and then let you query across them, right? It's like a versioning system for these boundaries. This was just the beginning of where Growmark needed this digital infrastructure and a great example of how this is gonna be critical for the future of agriculture. But it's going to continue to be an evolution. It always will be, because there's gonna be continued innovation, there's gonna be continued partners, platforms, things that aren't even birthed today show up in the next five, 10 years. That's just gonna to continue to drive uh, exponential growth and how we're utilizing technology to just enable our farmers to be more profitable. Well, hello, fellow ag nerds. Thanks so much for joining me for today's episode of the Future of Agriculture podcast. My name is Tim Hamrich, and if you're interested in where innovative ideas meet practical realities in food production, I think you found the right show. My final episode of 2020, so a little over a year ago now, was called Five Barriers Limiting Ag Tech and the Companies Breaking Through Them. It was episode 238, if you want to go back and listen to that one. One of those five barriers was lack of integrations between ag technologies. And the company I featured breaking through that barrier was Leaf Agriculture. It was in that episode where I learned the term digital infrastructure from Leaf founder Bailey Stockdale. Bailey is back on the show today with a Leaf customer to provide us with a case study of what data infrastructure looks like in practice. Bailey Stockdale is CEO of Leaf Agriculture, which builds developer tools for the ag industry. Now, what that means exactly is kind of what we're going to spend most of today's episode talking about. But in the meantime, you can think of them as the company that enables integrations between tech providers so that the user experience is seamless. In other words, technology users like farmers or agronomists would never know that they even exist. Their customers are the technology providers in the industry. That's people like Brendan Bachman who's going to join Bailey and I on today's show. Brendan is the Senior Agronomy Technology Manager at Growmark FS, which many of you have probably heard about. They're one of the largest producer-owned co-ops in the U.S. Brendan has worked for Growmark FS for about 16 years now in various agronomy and technology capacities. For the past five years, he's been in this capacity, working in strategy and implementation of different ag technologies with their various member companies and working with outside ag tech vendors to help them find market fit with their growers. After Bailey's first appearance on this podcast, the one I mentioned back in 238, we also featured Bushel in episode 275, diving deeper into this concept of digital infrastructure. Both of those we'll mention today, and they'd be great to re-listen to along with this one. Today, though, you're going to get something that you didn't get in those two other episodes, a tangible example of why digital infrastructure is needed in this industry. How companies like Leaf work with technology providers, and then we're going to end with a deeper exploration into how an infrastructure provider makes money, differentiates themselves, and deals with competition. This episode is definitely a good one for you ag tech nerds out there, but I think all of you are going to find it really fascinating. One technical note, though, uh, Bailey's AirPods failed us toward the end of the interview, so you're going to notice the audio quality changed pretty drastically on his end, but stick with it. He has some really interesting comments about how all of this plays out for the future of agriculture. First, though, we'll kick things off with Brendan Bachman explaining what led them at Growmark to ultimately work with Leaf. Yeah, so, you know, probably uh, four, you know, five years, I guess, like right on the onset of taking this position, we were really looking at, okay, what is in the marketplace? You know, where is the puck going, so to speak, with ag tech? And how do we work to bring tools to our companies that deliver a whole host of different value propositions? And so we started off, you know, working with, uh, you know, remote sensing and imagery. We started working with crop modeling. 
you know, our GIS tools are always, you know, the foundation of what we do. And what we found is we tried to take more of an integrator approach to technology, bringing pieces together and trying to collaborate into a singular platform or trying to drive a, a certain experience. We found that that's just difficult. It's really difficult when we have all these disparaging systems that have parts and pieces of what we want to bring together, but there's no real unification in the data. There's no real clarity on how that information can come together. And so what we found ourselves doing is trying to create a lot of ad hoc APIs directly between provider A and provider B to bring various pieces of their solutions together. Um, and we found out very quickly that APIs are meant to break in a lot of ways. And when things get updated uh, with various softwares, if we don't have people who are actively maintaining, watching, um, and facilitating that, we were getting into struggles where things were just flat breaking, to be honest with you. But maybe talk about the problem from a farmer's standpoint. With You were talking about the APIs being meant to be broken and nothing wanting to play well with each other. You know, What's that look like from your customer's point of view? Well, I mean, as we go out, you know, we've been talking what ag tech and big data and all these different value propositions with technology for the better part of a decade. And, you know, farmers have heard that message. I think farmers have tried to pursue that message. And a lot of times I think they end up getting, you know, disappointed. You know, we over promise and under deliver. And when you have a customer experience that is, you know, very jaded or, you know, very, for lack of a better word, very much interrupted because of certain technologies that work one day, you know, something is updated and, and then I can't access certain information or, you know, I just get frustrated in general because of the consistency of my experience. I think that's where a lot of farmers were at with the whole ag tech revolution as you look back over the past decade. I think a lot of systems are making really good progress. And as we looked at Growmark's approach, there's really three approaches we could have considered, you know, in ag tech. You can buy it. You can go out and acquire companies. You can build it internally and employ a bunch of developers to help, you know, develop a proprietary product, or you can integrate it. And so we've taken the integrator approach because we have so many partners because of, you know, being in the position we are, we get the ability to look across the ag tech landscape. And that integrator approach is something that we think is going to best maximize all of the capabilities that all these great uh, innovators are bringing to bear in the marketplace. And so when you take that approach, you do open yourself up to those failed experiences just because you're trying to connect systems, right? And so as we happened through that and, and painfully at times, we found that we needed to have somebody, some company, something really helping us with that strategy and really from the technical aspect more than the strategic aspect of bringing these systems together. Hmm. And from your perspective, what does that look like bringing them together? Can you maybe talk more about that from your angle? How does that manifest itself for you? You know, I think somewhat as a just you know a natural consumer base we are used to opening multiple apps but if you you know ask a grower or really any other consumer do you want it all in one app or do you want multiple apps everybody says they want one app until you explain to them how hard it is to maintain all these connected systems to a singular interface right and then they go okay maybe i'll deal with a couple different apps so we've kind of matured into you know we don't need one app to do it all but we may want a singular app or two that is directed towards a specific market dynamic inside of our Growmark FS business, right? So we have grain, we have energy, we have agronomy, and then we have e-business, right? Which is, you know, our statements, planning, bookings, things of that nature. Very cool. And, and Bailey, let's, let's kind of switch gears over to you. As you're building, you know, infrastructure is sort of an analogy, right? We know infrastructure to be roads and, and airports and bridges. So digitally, you know, you're building this infrastructure to enable what Brendan wants to do, to put all this together into a platform that actually provides solutions, not just tools. Maybe a, a place to start is, is what you're building for Brendan, if we're going to use the roads analogy, is it a gated community, the Growmark FS gated community, or is it a highway, a super highway that, you know, other people can sort of uh, on-ramp and off-ramp from? That, that's great. So I'm, I'm going to kind of break that into two segments. Uh, the first part, right, so, so with Growmark, 
they use our product, right? So we don't think about it that as a project, but they, you know, essentially, you know, on a usage basis by the number of acres that they're consuming, they're subscribing to, to our product. And so when they come and they say, we need these three new partners, we'll say, okay, when do you need them by? And then we'll go build that, right? As part of, we call that like a feature request, you know, so that's product enhancement for us. We're not going to build them, you know, for those integrations. So it's, it's everything that we build is publicly or generally available. Obviously, the, the data that they bring in and run through our product, that belongs to the grower, right? So that doesn't change the data ownership. It's really just for, it's in their instance, those same tools are broadly available to all of our customers. And that's really important for two reasons, right? First, it helps us, you know, scale and, and really lower barriers across the industry. And second, you know, as other customers will come and request, you know, new integrations, maybe Ag Leader or Farm Mobile or Stara in Brazil, right? Growmark will automatically benefit from that because their experience, right? They just added new partners that maybe they had on their roadmap in two years. Now it's immediately available to them today with no extra work. The second part about what it is, I'd like to get a little bit more specific than Brendan did. You know, he went kind of high level. When we first met Growmark, they had one problem and it was, we have field boundaries in three different places and we don't know which one to use and we need these to all kind of somehow work together. <laughs> so that's where we started. You know, when we went through that, we said, okay, well, we have these underlying API connections that we can bring together, access the boundaries, put them into a standard format, and then let you query across them, right? It's like a versioning system for these boundaries. They said, great, you know, we're going to use that and we're going to synchronize boundaries across systems. Perfect. Then they came back and they said, hey, you know what? We also need planting date. If you can get us planting date, you know, from our customers, you know, through Deer or Climate or, you know, whichever platform they use, that would be really valuable for our agronomy services. I think this is a good example of what infrastructure means when we say it. Getting planting date is a really innocent sounding problem, right? <laughs> it can't be that hard. Turns out if you want to get planting date or maybe like the beginning of the operation, end of the operation, you can access that data from the machinery information that you collect, you know, when you're running a, you know, any sort of precision agricultural monitor, right? That harvest data. So that harvest data, typically it's collected on the machine and then it's put on a thumb drive or it's streamed to a cloud platform uh, like Climate or Trimble or Raven or any of these machine data providers. Those are in proprietary binary formats. So very difficult to read. That operation is split across hundreds of different files for a single planting operation. And embedded in all of that proprietary, uh, those proprietary formats is that innocent sounding planting date, right? So what we're doing in the back end is we're grabbing that data from all the different APIs, right? After the user gives us permission to authenticate, grabbing that data, taking those files, we're translating them into a consistent format. And so this is everything from, you know, decoding it to then changing crop code four from John Deere to match crop code 23 for case right, into just corn, you know? So we're doing those kinds of transformations and then we're going a couple steps further, right? So now the data is translated and accessible, we're merging them into full operations, so a single planting event. And then as Brett had mentioned, we're summarizing that data. So now we're going from, let's say, you know, half of a gigabyte of all these loose files in random proprietary formats into a consistent, maybe two kilobyte JSON response that has the planting date very easy to grab. And we're also rendering images of that full operation. And so they can just grab in milliseconds, here's a PNG and overlay it, and here's the planting date. So when we talk about digital infrastructure, it's all of that nonsense in the middle <laughs> that, that goes from, I just want to get planting date into really just that from a front-end developer perspective. Give me the planting date leaf and they can query us, they can get that data and they don't have to worry about all of the complexity that it took to get to that very innocent end result. Yeah. Now this platform, did Growmark brand this platform and is the platform itself what your agronomists and your farmer customers know and just everything that's you know, underneath this sort of happening in the background? Is that how it works? Yeah, there's a lot of what I would consider pain in the ag tech world, right? And uh, we need to keep that sheltered from the end user. And how we do that is by creating a platform and an experience, leveraging people such as Bailey to help us through those struggles of what is the data utilization component of it. So all this is background information. We're not really marketing per se, you know, LEAF or the connected partners of the individual system. It's just one ecosystem from their perspective, right? And I think that's what we have to maintain is that user experience for, you know, our salesmen and our growers to where they see this as a seamless experience. They see this as an experience that is easily to attain 
tangible value consistently without really needing to know and understand all the complexities of what it takes to bring them that polished product in the palm of their hand. And so, you know, I think to answer your question directly, yeah, we market a platform that we brand with, you know, the, the FS trademark and all of these other intricacies is something that happens through authentication processes, happens through just different UI experiences within the app, but they really don't need to know or probably would care to know all the, the information and all the components to it that makes it what it is from their, their side of it. Yeah. And when you started working with Leaf, did you have to say, here are the partners we want to integrate and here's what we want it to look like? That's the first part of my question. The second part is, what happens when you want to add more partners down the road? You see other new exciting technologies that you can integrate. Are you better equipped to integrate those seamlessly because of this work? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I would say it was definitely mutual. I think that there were different companies that we desired to work with that we brought to Leaf's attention um, that they then actively work to develop APIs with. I do think that Leaf probably brings to us just as many opportunities to connect, probably specifically on the machine data side of things, than what we have requested, right? So as they continue to develop APIs into the broader market set, because we're such a, a closely related partner, that then gives us the ability to leverage those tools more efficiently, more quickly, and to be more nimble in this agile environment that we are in inside of AgTech today to capitalize on those opportunities as they come about. And Growmark's a cooperative, but uh, as listeners will know from previous episodes, just because you're dealing with cooperative members doesn't necessarily mean you getting their business is a given. So how are you able to use this new integrated system as a differentiator among people you're competing with out there for, for these agronomic services? Yeah, you, you said it well, Tim. You know, it's not a given, right? So what we're doing with our, our cooperative members we need to understand their value propositions. What are some of the key rocks, if I could call them that, that they're wanting to move for their customers and for value associated to the farm gate, first and primary, um, but then as relates to their FS member company. So as we look at what are some of the key differentiating factors for us, it's, you know, these applications are specifically built based upon the feedback of our users. So the features and the tool sets they have wanted, we've vetted and that we have continued to develop is something that is unique to the FS organization based upon their needs and desires and wants. This has probably been a four-year process in total, and it's somewhat laughable for me to go back in time and look at some of the massive, I would call them spreadsheets, but really sprints and tasks and different features and functions that we'd started with. And then through this refining process of uh, learning and iterating and just gritting it out at times in this ag tech space, what this polished product is starting to become. And so as I boil that down, it's really about needing to create a value proposition for our FS companies. And if we miss that mark, they're not going to put their time and effort, first off and foremost, nor some of their, their resources into these tools. And so we have to hit that value proposition for their farmers, which then relates directly back to their ability to differentiate and we've done that through a very collaborative process of learning, listening, iterating, and just continuing that over and over again. Very cool. Well, well first of all, I, I want to make sure I understood correctly. It sounds like, you know, what you're saying is, you know, kind of four years of trying to figure this out and you've been able to sort of kind of get the details aligned to where all of it is starting to come together. Is that is that right? Am I understanding what you just said there? Yeah. So if, if I uh, maybe use a sports analogy, so, you know, football fields 100 yards wide. We, over the last four years, have trekked down. We are now in the red zone, so to speak. And we're just starting to continue to put some of the final pieces together. And we have this particular tool in the marketplace today. But some of these, what I would consider value propositions that as relates to the entirety of the ecosystem is starting to get to where we're getting ready to cross the goal line. You know, we're going to have an experience here in the 2022 cropping season that is going to be, in my opinion, second to none for our FS member companies. And then as we, you know, put a few more final touches on what would be a broader execution strategy, we're really looking forward to 2023 and beyond 
level of value that we're going to be able to drive with our agronomy tools in the marketplace. You know, Bailey, Brendan gave us an example of how we had these apps that were developed, but it really wasn't bringing them to the solution they wanted. So through building this infrastructure, they were able to sort of build up this new app, you could call it. He called it a platform, this new ability to serve customers. Where does something like that go next? To the example you use in a lot of your blog and materials on, on your website, it's like app, infrastructure, new app, infrastructure, new app. Where might that go next? What's the next infrastructure that's needed for the next app? And, and you don't have to use that example if you don't want to. It's just easy because we just heard from him. Yeah, it's a, it's a really fun example, right? And I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the honest answer. But I would guess, right, when you look at a cooperative's model and the network, you know, one of the hardest things in ag tech is distribution. You know, obviously building stuff is difficult in the industry, but then once you have it, you have to go sell it and get customers. And that's really hard. And I think that's where you look at cooperatives and retail groups, and that's what they have, you know, and they know it. <laughs> They've got a network that people don't have to buy from them, but they, they usually do. And so I think if you look at that scenario, they are in a wonderful position to offer a lot of these digital services natively, right? So it's, it's kind of this already trusted brand they have, you know, maybe a personal relationship with. And then they can start layering new services on top of that, right? So I don't know, you know, but, but I would guess that they would be interested in taking a lot of the services that they currently provide, the agronomy, right, is a great example, digitizing that or making that more digitally enabled, as he's alluded to, and then maybe moving to these other services that we're seeing being developed, you know, in the fintech space and the carbon space and beyond with and, and sustainability, either with partners, right, which is probably what Growmark and I think some of their announcements have, you know, led to that, or, you know, potentially building some of those in-house in some cases. And how's your business model work as far as, you know, you're, you're partnering with these companies, they pay you. How do you decide how that should work? It's, uh, it's the companies that use our API to retrieve data, right? Their, their customers' data. We charge them on a usage model. It's typically a per acre pricing, but that will change, you know, in some cases, either geographically or, you know, based on needs and use cases. So we really try to get that value alignment with what they find valuable and how we charge them for that. We also have you know, wonderful partners, right? So if you look at Bayer and Climate, they're fantastic partners where they rely on us a lot you know, to build out these API ecosystems that they're working on. But then we will use that to really go connect with the companies that are going to be bringing in the climate data and we would treat them you know, as our primary customers. Although, right, there's a lot of recycling <laughs> where you know, certainly the, the same or similar needs exist on both, both sides of those relationships. And how do you, as a, a young company, decide where to go next? I mean, I would think almost for you, one unique challenge might be is like, wait, these people will pay us to do this, but is that really what's building the infrastructure that we want to build? I don't know if that's a common conversation, but I, I could see where it could be. How do you decide where to go next? Yeah, that's, that's probably what we think about the most. <laughs> I mean, really, you know, I literally, it's where I spend a lot of time thinking. And it's a very hard question. Like, I think if you think about what developer tools in agriculture means or digital infrastructure, that is a, a massive area, right? I would argue that it's everything from, you know, geospatial data storage at like more of a cloud provider level, all the way up to, you know, even, even agronomy, right? Or agronomy services could be considered digital infrastructure and these data science tools. And so you have this massive space that is, that is kind of this already poorly defined concept. And, and so then for us as a company, right, obviously we brand ourselves as building in this space. What does that mean? And I think for us, it means today starting pretty close to the foundation. So we're not going to do cloud things, right? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us. And we're not going to do, you know, agronomy things. That's, that's kind of what our customers do. And so we're not going to touch that. Our space is really, it's people like Brendan saying, I just need a summary of this data. Or for an, a, you know, an insurance company, I need to know planting date, harvest date, and, and what was applied. Okay, right. That's what our role should be initially. And I think as that evolves, we have to go across different data verticals. So starting to bring in, you know, the weather data, the soil data, we already do imagery, we already do field boundaries, irrigation, right? Work across these different data verticals and then build these, I would say, higher level services on top that don't really act as their own application, but they make it very easy for developers to then build applications on top of these higher level services. Brendan, if you were to kind of speculate or, or sort of, you know, just if we were to do some sort of visioning here for a minute, what new technologies do you think might be coming in the future, whether they're close or still far off? And what would it look like for you to integrate with them because of the work you're doing here? 
Yeah, I mean, there's so many things going on right now. It's really hard to figure out what's actually going to become real and tangible. And I think the reality for me is this. There is no one silver bullet. It's really around leveraging disparaging data sets and information and bringing that together through integrations to help drive further insight around those particular tools. One thing that we're going to continue to look at is crop modeling is something that I think is a buzzword to a certain degree because it's probably not well utilized today. So can infield sensors and various things give us that hyper local weather information that can maybe start being really, really accurate and predictive on things such as disease, predictive on things such as nitrogen loss, predictive in things such as yield forecasting. You know, as we start to look at what are some of the things that growers truly are going to find huge value in, it's giving me the right information to have a high confidence level that when I spend my hard earned dollars, I'm going to get an ROI on it. So those types of tools that can drive that confidence interval to levels never seen before through these these integrations is something that I think we're going to continue to be really focused on. And then, you know, the other side that I mentioned there briefly is around helping them understand what their output's going to be a month or so in advance, two months in advance, so they can take advantage of some of the marketing opportunities. Most growers don't sell up to their APH proactively, right? Because the what ifs happen. But if I could give you a 90 plus percent confidence interval that I could be within 5% of final yield in July, would that help you or give you the confidence to market that last 20 or 30 bushels of what we've quantified as, you know, somewhere around a 20 to 30 cent premium in the marketplace historically? That's big money for producers on 200 bushel corn plus, right? So those are some of the things I don't think there's, you know, something that's going to show up that's going to catch us off guard. I think it's going to be continued refinement of tools and, and topics and slogans, so to speak, that are in the marketplace today, but ones that we've probably not done a good job as an ag industry of actually expressing true value with thus far. Yeah, it, I, it sounds like a big part of that is because each of these individual tools is just a piece of the puzzle, and it required somebody to put the puzzle together. Yeah, that, that would be our vision, Tim. It's, uh, it's all here. It's all in the playground, so to speak, today just a matter of aligning them, pulling the right things through, presenting them in the proper interfaces with a overwhelmingly positive customer experience as far as consistency and the ability to operate. And I think we got a lot of opportunity here in ag tech. There's never a I've arrived moment, right? And so it's going to continue to be an evolution. It always will be because there's going to be continued innovation. There's going to be continued partners, platforms, things that aren't even birthed today show up in the next five, 10 years, that's just going to continue to drive uh, exponential growth and how we're utilizing technology to just enable our farmers to be uh, more profitable. So that's difficult to grasp at times in task-oriented operations, but I think it's very fruitful for those companies that continue to stay in it, grid it out, and just know that uh, we're in it for the betterment of uh, that industry. Yeah. Well, one question I have is, Bailey, a lot of times partner is a euphemism for customer. In this case, though, I, I think it really is a true partnership because, n number one, I think they really rely on on you. But number two, I think you also get the benefit of continuing to build this infrastructure where more partners can be involved. So it makes sense. I wonder, though, with like other companies that are trying to provide digital infrastructure, I thought it was interesting, you know, Bushel was just on and I saw that they announced some sort of integration and they thanked Leaf for providing it for them. And I thought, well, wait a minute, isn't Bushel a digital infrastructure company, but they're paying another digital infrastructure company to build infrastructure? How does that work exactly? And and what happens when there's more competition for infrastructure? Like, how does that play out? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, yeah, so Bushel's wonderful. You know, and, and we use partner... I try not to say partner very much, um, and I'm starting to try not to say digital infrastructure too much too, because <laughs> they just lose meaning, right? And and then with Bushel, so Bushel's wonderful, right? I think a lot of what they're building is fascinating, um, and and it it, it kind of comes back to this problem of digital infrastructure, meaning anything in this massive spectrum from like raw compute and storage all the way over to like an MRV tool, right? Which I would also consider to be digital infrastructure, and so. What we do is pretty specific. We're really focused on connecting with all the different APIs in the ecosystem, right, in the industry, and then bringing that data to a consistent format and making it as easy as possible for developers just to build on top of it, right? Access this, this standardized clean data and build with it. If you look at Bushel, 
right? Their digital infrastructure, I would argue, is still valid, right, to use that. But it's, it's different, right? Because they're really focused on, I mean, first of all, different data, right? A lot more of that grain elevator data and, and connecting the pieces of the grain marketing experience. It's just a different network. It's a different data type. And it's, it's kind of further down the chain than we would typically think about leaf services. Okay, yeah. It can be difficult to kind of wrap your head around, though, of like, so what happens when another company, we'll call it STEM, another company called STEM pops up and they're like, we're, you know, we're going to build digital infrastructure. It seems like you kind of have two highways going side by side, to, to use that analogy. Walk us through kind of how, how competition works in this business, because it's a little bit different from like software. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's going to, I mean, you know, we did it, we did the podcast last year and, and people were taking notes, you know, and so, but, but it's going to keep happening. And I think a lot of it is actually really valid and exciting and cool, right? So you look at the big like seed and chemical producers and they're starting to think, wait a minute, we're good at data science. We have a lot of data. What if we started exposing some of the things that we have internally, externally, right? And that's valid. I think that's wonderful um, because then, you know, those are fewer steps that developers that want to build it on top of those things have to take, you know, they can just take that and then plug it in and then build with it to build, you know, an, an ever higher service for their customers. Um, so that's really positive in general. I think the, the concept of the digital infrastructure is going to not make any sense, right? Like it's, it's, it's going to get very, very confusing quickly. So we're all going to have to figure out what we mean when we say that. And I think, you know, have it have specific examples. Competition, I mean, you know, usually we look at other industries and, and see how those things play out. It happens. Typically, competitors will acquire each other or they'll get really big and um, go after each other. <laughs> I think like cloud is probably the most mature digital infrastructure space today where you have, you know, you have big players. You have AWS, you have Azure, and you have GCP, and you have a few others like DigitalOcean, Heroku. You know, um, my instinct in agriculture is that we won't see very much direct competition between infrastructure companies for quite a while, right? If you look at Bushel and Leaf, we're not competitive really in, in any way. Um, and you know, we don't really intend to be competitive in the future uh, is, is my read on it. And I see that there's, there's so much to build in this broader space of the middle that I think it would be very strange for anyone to pick an area that is currently being served well, which I would argue, right, we are serving well. And, and, and decide that's where we want to live, right? I would, I would think that they would go to layers on top of it, right? So it's a really good example is something like um, fraud detection. You know, so if, if we speak with FinTech customers, they'll, they'll come to us and say, hey, Leaf is so great, this is awesome, but we really need to figure out fraud detection. That's not something that we're going to differentiate on. You know, we're, no one's, we're not going to land a customer because we have better fraud detection, but it's something that we need and it's something that we would love to have provided to us as a service. And to us, that's really interesting, you know, because it's like, okay, we didn't think that was part of what people would consider a infrastructure product or service, but it is. And so what does that mean to us? And I think it means if we are able to build fast enough, right, and build all the foundation that we intend to build today, and then eventually build services up to that level, whether that happens, wonderful, right, we'll do it. But most likely, right, there will be another company that comes up and builds a fraud detection service that's really, really great. And they build it on top of us, you know, but then they go serve that level of the market. And so I think that's what we'll see before we see a lot of direct competition fighting for the same spaces. You all are in a position to also help your partners, your clients, or whatever you want to call them, discover new data sources or discover new, you know, kind of integrations that they should be looking at. Is that a part of the service that you offer of like, well, hold on, what about using satellite imagery for this? Because wouldn't that be a helpful layer for you? Or is that totally, you just stay out of that? Yeah, we do. I mean, that's a big part of our, um, like our post sales strategy, right? Um, so if you look at, actually, Bushville is a great example. They started with imagery, you know, and, and that was it. And then so great, right? They're going to use our Sentinel 2 service and, you know, great. Then they started getting familiar with the product and started thinking, well, wait a minute, we actually are like our file processing process today is it's just OK and we're not super happy with it. We'd like to migrate that to Leaf. OK, great. So they did that and, and it lived there. And then, you know, over time, another three months or whatever, they say, OK, but we're also going to launch integrations with Climate and John Deere and, and, you know, in case, you know, longer term. Awesome. OK, well, you know, we still did a good job with the file thing. We know how their API works. Why don't we try them? And they try us and realize wait a minute, you know, we, we can do this. And so that's, that's how it starts. That's a big part of our like long-term strategy with, with customers is helping them in every way that they need throughout kind of that, that discovery. And then we'll also, you know, very lightly say in Brazil, for example, the third largest data provider is Stara, which is this regional provider. And so we build an integration with them and then we can go to all of our Brazilian customers 
and say, you know, wait a minute, we've found in, in research that Star is the number three data provider yeah, in Brazil, right? You should really consider adding them as well. Uh, and, and then for them, right, it's easy because they're already compatible with data. So they just need to add an authentication loop and boom, right? Then, then they just increase capacity. Yeah. That's what's on my mind is like, okay, well, what, you know, what are you seeing from your unique vantage point that are opportunities to better serve customers out there? Because that would be, I'm sure you'd have some, some interesting ideas on that, but I'll let you keep them to yourself right now if you'd rather. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think it's a, like, it's, it's super basic examples today and that's kind of the fun part, you know? So I, I think the Growmark example is perfect. Brendan, they needed field boundaries that made sense and, and they needed planting date. Like literally that was our first conversation, you know, when I turned down to their office, that was it. And so um, starting from there, I think now we're starting to launch a lot of these services that make those kinds of things stupid simple, where you don't have to worry about files. You don't even have to know that farm data files exist. You know, you can just hit our field operations API, get the full operation, grab it from the summary, and that's it. And so I think taking that same level of thinking across all of these different data types, that's, that's what we need to do first, because once you have that, then you can build those services and layer them. An important thing about how we think about this product evolving is that you can hit the field operation service and get, you know, the number of seeds planted for the entire operation, even if it's done with like two different brand, brand machines, you know, so that's cool. But all of the underlying services that we use to build that, right, because we built that on top of our own services and all of those individual services are also exposed. And so if you show up as a developer and say, in my architecture, I want to do the merge on my side, but I'm going to use Leaf for the data translation. But I'm going to do the, the file combination on my side because, you know, I have this special way of doing it. That's, that's absolutely possible and it's exposed, right? So that's a valid use case. If you come up and you say, okay, great, I want to do all of that, but then I'm going to do my own summary and I'm going to generate my own images from this full operation. Also valid, right? So you can use any piece of this larger like Lego stack um, to, to architect, you know, in the way that you need to do it. So that's, I think, another important thing as we think about future products, fraud detection, for example, right? If we do build that, that will be built in a way where every individual piece of it, all the services that it's built upon, are also individually exposed. And those can be repurposed for carbon or for you know, whatever else that we're not thinking about today. Well, thank you very much to both Bailey Stockdale and Brendan Bachman for being on today's show. Learn more about Leaf's work over at withleaf.io, which is W-I-T-H-L-E-A-F.io. And Growmark, of course, is just at growmark.com. I hope that clarified what can often be a abstract concept. I really appreciate those guys sharing their story. What other abstract concepts should we work to clarify on this show dealing with the future of agriculture? I would love for you to let me know at tim at aggrad.com or send me a DM on LinkedIn or Twitter. I don't usually take guest pitches. I get plenty of those, but I always get excited to receive recommendations on topics or questions that we can explore. Thanks so much for your time and your attention. I don't take it lightly. I'll be back next week with another story of ag innovation. Innovation.